Uh, we're going to change directions now a bit and look at the role of religions um, in encouraging science or not encouraging science. The relationship between the religions that we practice as humankind and scientific um, approaches. In the 16th century, when the first Jesuit missionaries went to China and went to the court of the emperor in Beijing, uh, they went with scientific instruments, telescopes and things like that to uh, introduce to the emperor of China. He was very interested in astronomy and so forth. And so these Jesuits brought their most modern scientific inventions along with them when they went to China. And so the Jesuit missionaries introduced modern science to the court in China. Why would they do that? Why did they feel that going to China with the gospel and taking with them uh, scientific knowledge and understanding was, uh, was the way to go. Well, you don't need to go to the Jesuits to see that this happening. When my uh, father and mother went to Tanzania, among the Zanaki people, I've talked about that quite frequently, <laughs> I mentioned several times that uh, the infant mortality rate was horrendously high among the Zanaki people. So many babies died and a notion had gotten into their culture that a mother's milk is poison. And so the mothers would feed their babies gruel and that contributed to the high mortality. Somehow this idea had gotten into the culture. And so when my father and mother arrived, mother introduced modern science. She was not a um, doctor or a nurse, but the babies were dying mostly because of three different problems, malaria, uh, dysentery, and, um, um, and then the sores on their bodies and so forth. And so she introduced simple basic medicines, scientific medicines, to deal with this high, high death rate. And I'm told that she would uh, take me, her little uh, newborn son, and she would show these women her nursing me and would say that her milk is very good and look how this baby is thriving on her milk. And uh, so uh, encourage the women to also feed their baby their milk, that God has created us, our bodies good and uh, the milk in a, mother, a mother's milk is just exactly right for her baby. The infant mortality rate dropped very dramatically um, with the introduction of that basic, simple, scientific approach to dealing with medicines, with, with, with diseases. And even my own life is attributable to um, scientific uh, technology and understanding. Um, for many years, missionaries who went to Africa nearly all died because of malaria. There was no awareness of the science of um, quinine, which kills the malaria parasite. And so they would go and many, many died. In fact, my father and mother thought that probably or possibly they will die of malaria. Well, about the time they went or sometimes before they arrived in, in East Africa, actually, uh, scientists had discovered through the pygmies actually in the Congo uh, who knew all of this and uh, that, that uh, the uh, leaves from a quinine tree when taken will cure you of malaria. And so I arrived, I was born just about the time that this discovery is taking place and it's spread all across Africa. And although I've had malaria many times, I lived uh, due to excellent uh, medical care in the form of the leaves, the pills that come from a quinine tree. This is all to say that the church in its global movement around the world has taken science with it wherever it goes whether it be Ritchie, the uh, uh, Jesuit priest in Beijing, China, or be it Alta Schenk at that tiny little clinic on the back stoop of our house, didn't even have a house in which to go into for this medicine that she offered, meeting week after day after day with the mothers with their sick babies, nurturing the babies back to health with scientific medicine. Now, why is that so? Why is it 
that wherever the Christian gospel goes, science goes with it. What is it about science that makes the church feel very right about it? So right about it that Ritchie would cart across the Silk Road and so forth up to Beijing his scientific instruments to show the, the um, Chinese emperor, emperor. Why did he do that? What is it about science and gospel that seems to say, stay so close together? <laughs> when you look at the biblical worldview, it's, it, and, and explore it carefully, you find that the biblical worldview creates within a culture the kind of soil, worldview soil, that encourages science. So what is that worldview soil? What is that meta-narrative which forms a culture in ways that lead this culture to embrace science? What is this worldview? Well, first is God created. God created. Now, how can that be a foundation for modern science? Because God of the Bible creates, he is trustworthy. And so if God has created the world, he will create it in a trustworthy way. Tomorrow, I expect to be in an airplane flying across the Atlantic Ocean. I hope to arrive safely. Why, why do I hope that? For many reasons, certainly God being with me and all of that. But very significantly, I find the laws of creation that God put in place trustworthy. So the air currents and the speed of the airplane and the engines that burn the fuel, all of these systems will work reliably because the laws of creation are reliable. The laws of aerodynamic, for example, were not invented by humankind. They were discovered by humankind and they are found to be trustworthy and reliable. So that's the first principle. God, create, God, is, God is trustworthy. And so his creation is reliable and trustworthy. I can understand. Secondly, Creation is not God. We've talked about these autocratic worldviews uh, where it is perceived that the divinities of nature uh, create natural phenomenon. When you believe that, if that's what you believe, as would be true of the tribal people among whom I grew up in East Africa, if that's what you believe, then if a root of a tree is giving you a problem, you will offer sacrifice to the root. You won't exercise um, covering the root up with earth or even cutting it out of the trail. No, you wouldn't do that at all. You would rather offer a sacrifice to the root. I remember some years ago, I was in uh, Peru and I noticed that the uh, persons among whom our missionaries were serving that it was a very hilly area, very mountainous, very hilly. I noticed that these uh, Peruvians up there in those mountains, when they would take a plow, they would run the plow, they would carry the plow up to the top of the hill, and then they would pull it down like this, and up to the top of the hill and pull it down like this. That's how they would do their plowing. And before they did their plowing, they would offer sacrifices to the uh, gods of fertility within the, within the hill these divinities within the hill, the, the, the pregnant uh, hill, symbolizing pregnancy, fertility, and so forth. So they would offer prayers to this god of the hill, and then they would start their plowing like this. The consequence was that in due course, all those hills will become deserts, you see, because when it rains, the rain would run down the furrows and wash the soil off, and eventually the soil became thinner and thinner, and finally, the whole hillside would be washed away. And I said to our people who were serving, I said, listen, it is very important that you place Bible teachers in every village in this region and teach them that the earth is not God. 
The earth is created by God, and they should care for the earth. And this way of plowing would destroy the earth. It would destroy the, 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 the fertility of the land. It will turn this fertile land into a desert. There's urgency at moving among these hills and communicating the biblical meta-narrative that God created the earth good and we should care for it. It's not a God to be worshipped. It's a creation to be cared for. That was my urging. And we did. We placed some development workers in those hills who did exactly what I was suggesting. Uh, Bible studies up and down those mountains. Genesis 1, you just can't exaggerate the significance of Genesis 1. If you're going to introduce into a culture that believes the earth is God, if you're going to introduce them into a scientific worldview, you just have to get through with Genesis chapter 1, which is what our, our team was doing. Not only has God created this earth, but it's a good earth. It's good. In fact, the biblical scriptures say it's very good. And it is real. We've talked about the Hindu conviction that the earth and the phenomenal world is illusion. If you believe it's an illusion, you're not going to investigate your days in scientific research. You'll rather you'll just enjoy the illusion. But if you believe that it's real and good, that becomes the seedbed which helps to create a scientific worldview. Not only is it real and good, but within biblical faith, you see, that creation is understandable and has reliability. Because as I said a minute ago, God himself is trustworthy. And therefore, we can study the laws of creation, the laws of nature, and trust that they will function predictably. Hold on to your chairs, much more. God's first command to Adam and Eve are really commands having to do with development. He says, have children, first command. Then he says, care for and develop the earth. Trim the trees, cultivate the soil, cultivate the land, care for the earth, care for the garden. One very astonishing command, right there after he creates Adam and Eve, is to name the animals. Within Islam, it is God who names the animals. And Adam learns the names from God. So God will say to Adam, that's a crocodile. And Adam says, crocodile. In fact, that's one reason Satan, according to the Quran, became so upset about Adam and deceived him, leading him to be sent out of paradise. Satan was upset because when God would teach Adam the name of an animal, Adam would remember it. When God taught Satan the name of an animal, Satan would forget it. He wasn't intelligent enough to keep remembering these names. And so Satan became very jealous of Adam, um, which is a chronic understanding of what was going on there. But within Islam, as I say, it's God who names the animal. So God says crocodile, Adam says crocodile. He learns the name. Within biblical faith, it's turned upside down. It is Adam who names the animals. He has that authority. That's awesome. That's an awesome authority that Adam had to name the animals. Because naming the animals mean to take responsibility for them, to care for them, to, uh, to have dominion over them. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com.